Hello, everyone. This is Nora Armani, founding artistic director of the Socially Relevant Film Festival New York. And this is our third day of talks with Meet the Filmmakers, which are broadcast live on our YouTube channel and simultaneously on our Facebook page. So uh, on our Facebook profile and page. So we have in the studio here with us today a number of filmmakers whose films all revolve around the theme of home and belonging. Some of them are more about the theme of homelessness, but instead of um, emphasizing the negativity or the homeless issue, we wanted to put the emphasis on, on home and what home means to any one of us, anyone who has a home and also anyone who does not and aspires to have a home. We also have our moderator, uh, Linda Selman, and uh, I am going to introduce them to you in a second after I tell you a little bit about the film festival. This is our eight, uh, eighth annual edition. I can't even bring myself to understand or believe it, how fast it has all gone, but it has been a great pleasure to promote over 400 films from all over the world that we have had an occasion of seeing, uh, enjoying, becoming enthusiastic about, and then presenting them to our audience. Our uh, hope is that the audience will share this enthusiasm and will enjoy the films as much as we have enjoyed programming them and bringing them to you. How to go about purchasing your films, uh, tickets, and seeing the films. Let me tell you a couple of things about it. In the past, we used to be in a real cinema when the world was a normal situation without COVID being around, and people would purchase a ticket online or in person and would show up at the cinema, show the ticket, be ushered in, sit down and watch the films. Well, unfortunately, last year, four days short of our grand opening at the Lincoln Center, COVID had different plans for us. So everything closed down and we were obliged two months later in June to take our film festival online. When we went online, we had absolutely no experience about how streaming platforms work. So we started sending people links with passwords, which were quite simple, probably just you click the link, put the password and watch the movie. However, for us, it was a huge headache trying to organize that people who said, I didn't get my link, where is my link and so on. So this year, we wanted to play like the grown-ups and go to a streaming uh, service. We have a wonderful streaming platform, Spark Film, uh, Spark Fest Live. Uh, the link is accessible through our uh, website, and this is our website because it's easier for me to um, show you the festival website. Uh, as one stop shop and then there is a big red button on the home page you click that it will take you to the streaming site where you will see all the films when you scroll down you can watch uh, you can see the films read about them but to purchase a ticket like every ticketing site you need to log in once you log in you can go to tickets and uh, the first thing that will appear is your all access pass, which is the best option because with $75 all access pass, you can see 63 films from 33 countries. But you can also choose to only pay $7 and see one film. In that case, you go down the list, you find the film you want to see, you click the number of tickets in the little slot next to the film, not the code, not anything else. The number of tickets, one, two, three, five, whatever. One is enough, I guess, if you're at home. So, and then you scroll down that list past all the other films, all the way down to check out. At the checkout, there is a little donation button, which we are always welcoming donations, but it's not mandatory. You don't have to do anything there. The next little 
slot is where you put your code. If you have a code because you were sent one as an early bird ticket buyer. When you do that, the number that you are seeing that shows the price of the ticket by magic turns to zero. If you have a discount code, the number shows the discounted number. Below that, there is a credit card link. You put your credit card. Next thing you know, the film and films have a button which says watch now. At that moment, you can click on that and enjoy the festival. I had to go through this lengthy description because people uh, were asking us and we are happily sending them this information. But this way, it will be on one of the, uh, uh, one of the videos that will be posted on YouTube and people can refer to them uh, when they like later. Again, the website is your key because it also has the schedule and all the other events. So let me go back and bring our wonderful people together with me. And I will introduce you Linda Selman here, who is our moderator for this session. Linda is a playwright, the director, actor, producer. She wears many hats an author, museum cur uh, curator, and she said, I, I think her, the production uh, she has, the film or uh, stage production company is called Many Hats. Am I right, Linda? Yeah. And she's the chair of the theater committee at the National Arts Club, and uh, we are happy to have her as, as a team member. She's a socially relevant film festival team member for a long time now, and she's moderating today's uh, session. So I give you the mic, Linda. I think we're gonna take a turn for to have every filmmaker introduce themselves, and then Linda will uh, shoot you with questions. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. It's yours, Linda. You are muted. Remember, you are muted, Linda. So yeah, now you're you're fine. Okay. Can everybody else unmute? Okay. Well, people, when you are not speaking, uh, you can mute yourselves in case you are sitting somewhere where it's there is a lot of background noise because the mics are picking them up. But if you're in a quiet spot, feel free to keep your mics on. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. And, and welcome, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here moderating this, this afternoon. I loved all the films in this theme. It was, uh, they were surprising to me. They touched me emotionally. They, they made me rethink my values. They made me face myself in ways I really wasn't doing, even though home and homelessness was facing me. To be honest, uh, I, I live on the Upper West Side and we had the homeless come a block and a half away from where I live in a hotel. And our community truly had to face our uh, responsibility and emotional attachment to people who were homeless. And um, it was quite an experience. Some ran away from it, some hated it, some embraced it. By the end, people were giving their clothes to everyone, <laughs> having parties, having, uh, having food, eating together. But it took, I'd say, about two to three months for the community finally to settle in. So I was very, very happy to take this theme on since it truly touched me viscerally. Let me introduce um, our filmmakers. Elizabeth, can we start with you? Please tell us the name of your film. 
Sure. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Phillips and Weiner, and I'm the producer and composer of Gets Good Light, um, which is a short film about a real estate broker who is faced with um, the difficult decision of how to help his coworker during a run in with ICE. Thank you. And Jenna. Yep. Hi, everybody. I'm Jenna. I'm an actor, writer, and filmmaker based in New York City. I live in Jersey City, uh, right across the river. Um, so my film is called Belady My Country, and it is about a young Muslim immigrant from Egypt who, uh, fearing deportation, connects with a lonely Jewish widow. And um, the story is actually based on my father and his immigration story and the woman he eventually lived with who became like an adopted grandmother to me, my grandma Fritzi. Um, yeah. And Arnold. Hi, I'm Arnold and I am the uh, director of The Turn and I uh, co-produced it with my wife, Andrea, who's uh, working right now, so she couldn't be here. But um, we, I'm based in LA, by the way, I'm the only West Coast person here. Um, but our film is about a homeless man who's down on his luck and he meets a, a nice woman who gets to know him and ends up helping him out to get back on his feet. And um, it's a very relevant issue at the time, especially here where I am and um, felt like it was a message that we needed to say for a festival. It's very interesting. You've, you've told, you've really told your stories, but when I saw it, I didn't know these stories. I saw frame after frame after frame, and I had no idea where these stories were going. And I had to sit at the edge of my seat and think, what is going to happen? And how is this going to turn, around, uh, turn out? And I must say, um, I was shocked and surprised by every one of these films. I had no idea that the turnaround would be what it is. So when audience, when you watch these films, forget what they just said. <laughs> Look at it as if it's your first time and try to immerse yourself in, uh, in each and every moment and forget about the ending. So the first, um, one of the things I wanted to say that each film shakes us out of our sentimental notions and habits of what home actually represents to each of us. So let's start with Elizabeth. How did the idea of your film come about? So um, the writer of our film, uh, Gets Good Light, is um, Daniel Soleil. And I met Daniel at uh, the NBC Universal Short Film Festival a few years ago. Um, I was there with another film I produced. Um, and he and I and my directing partner really hit it off. And we kind of kept in loose touch over the years. And he actually reached out to my directing partner, um, in 2018 with the script Forgets Good Light. And um, he thought she would be a really good fit for the project. And then she brought me on board. So the idea actually came from a writer and then we all paired together and our, our common connection was through um, the NBC Universal Short Film Festival. So it kind of came together in that way. Do you know the, the idea, how the idea came to the writer? I think that um, it, it was, uh, you know, our film centers around um, immigration and ICE. And I know that it was a year into Trump's presidency and we were all just feeling the urgency of this issue and seeing the treatment of immigrants coming into this country and just feeling like it was so not right. And that's kind of what sparked the idea for Daniel and made him want to tell this story um, was just a feeling of what can we do? And we as filmmakers responded with this film. So for him as a writer, it was really a kind of a call to action of how can I tell somebody's story that might be able to shed light on what it's like to be an immigrant in America under Trump's presidency. And it's very interesting, everybody. 
it is written like a mystery. You have clues all over the place and you don't understand why someone is in a particular place and what is it that they're doing and how come they look the way they do and yet they're doing what they're doing. I mean, you're really, um, it, you really have to be a sleuth. And of course, by the end of the film, all the pieces come together mm -hmm. and it's, it's filmed in a very sophisticated way, extremely sophisticated, very, very moving. And uh, it's like a puzzle. Uh, Jenna. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Jenna, please tell us about your film. And uh, how did the idea of the film come about? Yeah, so kind of similarly to what Elizabeth was saying with... Um, being in Trump's presidency with ICE and the increasing xenophobia that um, the, that the immigration narrative in particular was experiencing. Not that it's anything new, certainly been around, but um, I, I got really curious about um, imagining what it would be like if um, my father came here in this present day and um, how impossible his story sort of is because he really has one of those like, American dream stories that I don't know is possible necessarily anymore in the same way. And I just became very curious. What do you mean? Give us just a little bit about what you mean. Um, I, I just think um, it's much more difficult for people to, I mean, certainly during Trump's era, which President Biden just reversed, but with the Muslim ban, for example. Um, and We don't know that you're Muslim. And uh, so oh. this is very good. Yeah, well, my father, yeah, my father um, and my half of my family is Muslim. Um, yes. So really, I was inspired to make something as a response to to the xenophobia, the Muslim ban, this like fear that um, we have of people that just happen to be Muslim. Um, and I, so all of these ideas were swirling in my head and I wanted to really create a, 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 a film about about a, uh, a Muslim guy who ends up living with an Ashkenazi Jewish woman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> doesn't really happen every day. Um, and it's a really, I became really interested in, in who these two characters were in a way that I'll never know the guy my father was that came here that didn't speak English, that didn't, the, no money, no family. I'll, I'll never know him. But this was kind of my way for my imagination to sort of um, ex explore what, what that must have been like. And, and also, like, that's something I could never do. Like, can you imagine being 20 years old and picking up and moving to another country and just starting over? So this was kind of, um, these are the things that were swirling in my head as I was writing it. And, um, and I do think, or I hope that it sort of... Um, is uplifting to people. And, and for me, I know that it makes me in a, in a time of so many questions, what does it mean to be an American and, and what do I feel proud of? I feel I do like, like the swirl of it all and, and how um, there are people that can meet that maybe you would never um, get to meet in, in another place, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes total sense. Mm -hmm. And when you watch it, you have no idea of how these two people can possibly get together. Right. And it is so touching. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you about it because, again, I saw these films without knowing anything about them. And um, it just touches your heart and your humanity comes out. And and you begin to see how how foolish you are about what you think people are like or how they look or what they expect of you or what you expect of yourself. Uh, and these are short films, everybody. These are short films and yet they have this large, large influence on you and your life. Thank you, thank you. And Arnold, Arnold, your film too. Uh, I was really surprised by your character, 
And again, by the end of it, I never in a million years would have expected your character to say and do what he did. It's just breathtaking. <laughs> well, tell thank us, you. <laughs> tell us about how this idea came. Did you know this person? Is this an imagination? It, what it's about fully, it? It's fully a work of fiction. It's all, you know, imaginative. We well, actually, I must tell um, you, everybody, everything is imaginative, right? But when you see it, you have no idea that it's an imagination that's creating this. It feels so realistic. It's just uh, mind-blowing. Cool. I'm well, sorry, Arnold, but that know, is okay. a compliment. I mean, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, and, and for our film, um, you know, it was actually made for a 48-hour film festival. It was all done in a very short time window. Um, and it, we did it last June. Um, that was kind of like the height of the Black Lives Matter movement and also kind of in the middle of the beginning of the pandemic. So we were shooting it very carefully. Um, it was like a skeleton crew. There were only a couple of us shooting it. And um, we wanted to do a film that was, you know, obviously socially relevant, um, referring to Black Lives, but not being about it. Just having that as the overarching theme of the film and showing, you know, conveying our message without making that the name of the film. Um, and then also on top of that, in LA, we've had a major homelessness problem that has really mm -hmm. surged in the past year. I mean, in yes. literally one year, it's almost doubled. Um, and I feel like that's been overlooked very heavily um, due to the pandemic, due to everything else going on in the world right now. Um, everyone has kind of overlooked that. So we wanted to make that part of our message in the film is that, you know, to have compassion and to, to see these people and to, to realize that we need to find a solution, you know, urgently um, because it, you know, that, that to me is a very large crisis um, that, you know, as you said, uh, you see every day. Um, and so that was a, another message in our film that we wanted to, to tap on, but not only make it about that, make it a, a bigger message about, you know, a person. Um, a human so, being. Yeah, a human being. Yes, all of these films, you 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 move, you come away with the understanding that this is a human being, and at any moment you could be in their shoes. That uh, I think the pandemic has done this to us. You know, they keep saying the famous word, the existential moment. This is it. Um, and what will you do? And and the truth is you have ideas about what you would do. You think you know what you would do. But when the moment comes, as we're seeing, you don't know. And just it just happens and you go with the flow of your essence and hope for the best, right? Yes. Tell us, how did you find the Socially Relevant Film Festival? And... And what made you think, well, this might be a good match for my film? Um, oh, let's start again with Jenna. Yeah, uh, I found it on Film Freeway. And I love, I love, you know, social justice and issues that are socially relevant and important to society. And I thought that it was it just sounded like something I wanted to be a part of so I applied and I've really enjoyed watching everyone's films um, like you've said Linda it's um, you know I I do art because I, I love people I love humanity and there's so much that I hope for in our certainly in our in our country in particular of course we could talk about that on a global scale as well but I wanted to be part of a festival that really um, championed stories that have something to say that aren't just, you know, entertainment. Not that there's anything wrong with entertainment, but um, yeah, so that's why I applied. Excellent. And Arnold, tell us about you. Um, it was actually my wife who applied and it was the same. Uh, we, we tell us the about your wife. Too. Yeah, yeah. Um, she she was the one who found it. I'm I, I think she found it also on Film Freeway. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure, 
but same as you, we were looking for, you know, a Could social you tell justice. us a little bit about Film Freeway? Maybe people don't even know about it. Um, yeah, I was about to say Film Freeway is just a site where you can you can apply and submit to any type of film festival. You can look for, you know, categories or genres or anything specific. And um, in the case of, you know, socially relevant, um, I feel like that was like the overarching theme of all of last year. So um, that's what we looked for and we found your festival. And, um, and yeah, thank you for having us on board. Oh, our pleasure. And you, Elizabeth? Um, I heard about uh, the Socially Relevant Film Festival through a friend. Um, her name's Kimberly Browning, and she knows a ton about film festivals, and she always has amazing suggestions, and she's a film festival director herself of the Hollywood Shorts Film Festival. And um, she, you know, we, our, our film obviously centers around themes of social justice, and we really thought of it as a, a piece of activism through art. Mm -hmm. And so she thought it would be a perfect fit and we're really excited to be here amongst so many other films that are are using their storytelling ability as activism and um we're just happy to be here and let me let me ask you all you all have these short films why did you choose short films elizabeth um because you could have had them longer you could have had the medium size and then you could have had them, you know, an hour or two. What what was it about the genre that attracted you? You know, I think that short films are are great for a number of things. And and, you know, sometimes the story you're trying to tell could be longer and you're using, a, you're making a short film first to kind of show it as a concept piece in the hopes to make it longer. And mm -hmm. other times a short film is self-contained um, just as its own standalone piece. Um, and it can just be, you know, a story that you put out into the world and it makes rounds on a festival circuit and you just want to get as many eyes on it as possible. I think for, gets good light in particular we really thought of this as a standalone piece and um something that the world in itself could certainly be developed and and added on to um but it also tells a complete story beginning middle end um that we wanted to put out into the world at, to raise awareness of um how immigrants were being treated in america it's sort of like a a slice of time almost told in a film and how um people just because you're uh undocumented your your life could be changed on a dime and you really have no control over that and you could be separated from your family members lose your job uh, at a moment's notice um so there's it's just a, a really different world um, yes and, and one of the things that happens in this film is who comes to save you? Exactly. Might be the last person you thought would be right, you know, who would do it. And maybe for that person, it was the last thought on her mind. But when push comes to shove, all of a sudden, they're able to do it. That's the beauty of your film. It's, 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 it, it, that's what I mean by waking you up. You don't know you're going to do what you do until the moment is there. Wow, I cannot help but interject here. <laughs> because this theme that you just pointed to is the same for every uh, each of these films. And yes. We see that in The Turn, we see that in Baladi, and we see that in Gets Good Light. The least expected person that was likely to do something to help with the situation, to change the situation, is the one who ends up doing something about it. So, uh, wow, th there is something very deep and very beautiful in that. Sorry, <laughs> I had to come. No, th I, that's what I think makes these special. So one of my questions to them is, uh, was this planned from the beginning when you had your concept or was it something that developed 
as you were in process of filming and you thought, wow, you know, at this moment, I think I'm going to turn it around. Wh which is it? Can I ask them, Nora? Yes, of course. Now you can ask anything you like. It's your platform. <laughs> oh, okay. Because I'm a writer. And, and that, you know, in, in writing, uh, there's sort of a, a construction. You, you start from the habit of people, and then you have a conflict that comes up, and that protagonist always fights the conflict and says, oh, you came to the wrong person. I'm not the right person. And the conflict gets stronger and stronger until the person goes, you're right, it's me. And by the end of the play, they're totally different or the end of the story. So let me ask you, Arnold, was this something you knew right from the beginning you wanted to do? Or was it a process that you came to in creating the film? It was during the creation that we decided we wanted to have that character that has a coming of age moment. Um, I'd say it was in the late part of the writing phase that we decided that. And um, and I've done this on, on previous films that I've, I've shot and written. Um, I always love seeing that stubborn character finally, <laughs> you know, open their eyes a little bit. I always feel like that that moment is a, a, a great moment to have, not only for a character in a film, but just in life in general. Um, so that that key element was something we did pretty early on. Excellent. And what about you, Jenna? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely planned. Right, writing it, I, I mean, the, the film, although it is based on real people, is completely fictional. That's not actually how my father met my grandma Fritzi. But I wanted to create, as you said, dramatic structure and um, generosity of spirit was really the theme that I was going for. Mm. And how these characters um, can give each other things, um, even even at somewhere like a diner with co-workers <laughs> and, and and small the, the small everyday things that don't seem significant. Um, so yeah, I, that definitely became a big the the theme I would say of the film and 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 the ending was something that so you know endings are hard. I'm sure you as a writer know that. So oh that, God, yes. Yeah, that was a lot of back and forth, and I you know for a short. Um, I but I I decided that this is how I wanted to go for the short and. Well, now what this mate? What was the decision? How did you get to that moment? You went no, I'm going to do it. Um. It just, it was just a feeling really. It just okay. different. I wrote a couple different drafts and some that were more realistic and it just didn't, it wasn't as exciting to me. And um, it just, the, the image of like the sun and like warmth and like we use very warm colors in the film, like a warm color palette and the idea of change. These are two lonely people and like um, changing points in, in their lives. And then it became like autumn. So we're like, oh, this takes place in autumn when the seasons are changing and it's such a time of like renewal and and it kind That's of beautiful from there. Yeah. So everybody, so see, even the sensory world, the 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 color palette of a film is so important, even though it doesn't have language, it is really communicating something to you that you pick up. And Elizabeth, I know you didn't write it, but do you know from uh, speaking to your creator, to your writer, um, was this something that was planned or was it, again, like other people? No, I just came as we did it. Um, this was definitely planned uh, from the beginning, and, and it was one of the earliest things we talked about. Um, Gets Good Light is really about um, solidarity and how far you would go to help someone. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, we talked a lot about, I think living in New York, we all have these moments where you see things that are wrong and you, or you, you've seen them happen to other people and you think, what would I do if I saw that happening? What would I do if I saw a, a cop arresting someone and they were being too violent? What would I do if, if I saw someone getting harassed on the subway um, would I speak up? How far would I go? Would I go to jail for them? What, like, 
all of these big, mm -hmm. big questions were what we wanted people to think about when they walked away from our film. Um, and I think you did a great job. This is a very slick film. <laughs> Thanks. It reminds me of a British film. Oh. Yes, it, 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 uh, it's very slick. Everything about it is slick, including the people. <laughs> and, um, and I was shocked at the end. I, I didn't put the pieces together. You know, d d did you feel the same way, Nora? I mean, each one of these films had a twist as well, you know? Uh, and it's funny because uh, for some reason we are, sometimes I've tried to put thematically films that are not necessarily all narrative or not necessarily all documentary, but themes go together. But in this particular case, we're dealing with narratives and they're all structured films, uh, scripted films with actors, but also each one has a twist in the end. We won't talk too much about that because we don't want the spoilers and we don't want people to think, oh, I've seen it already, I'm not gonna bother. But we urge people to get to see these little pieces of jewels because first of all, they're not gonna take your entire evening. If you're binging on some Netflix uh, series, you can still go and do that. But please make the time to see these little jewels before because they are really little jewels and they open the road, open the way to filmmakers coming up with uh, bigger films with more stuff. And each of them can be potentially developed into a feature film. So I heard Linda uh, saying, asking the question about why did you choose the short film? Sometimes a filmmaker has no choice but do a short film because of budget constraints and also because of feasibilities. It's a big task to do a feature, especially in the narrative uh, department. With documentaries, it's a little easier as we've been having a lot of documentary filmmakers until now who were speaking about their films and how that developed. But each one of these films, uh, Ballady, The Turn, uh, Gets Good Light, they are potentially uh, the little seeds for a feature film to come. Uh, yes, and, and one of the filmmakers, I'm sorry they're not here, my Mexican Brazil. Yeah. Brazil. Brazil. Um, Brazil. Brazil. Um, Brazil. I'm not sure how to how you pronounce. No, I think it. it's bretzel. Bretzel, it's like a pretzel, but bretzel. Yes. Oh, yes. I think you're right. I, I see that because they use home move or uh, home movies. Yeah. And, and it is also a turnaround too. Yeah. And 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 again, you're 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 shocked. And um. It, it's more of a puzzle than any of the others, except um, maybe yours, Elizabeth, where you don't put the pieces together until the very end. And then all of a sudden, um, my husband and I, we play games, you know, during the pandemic. And, and we are saying, uh, maybe we should get a puzzle and do a puzzle. And then we saw your films and we went, these are like puzzles. They're visual puzzles. So it's very yeah. exciting. So I want to ask you, what do you expect to get from this um, film festival? And where do you want to go after it uh, in terms of distribution, in terms of its impact, in terms of where you can show it again. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is you should all call, get in touch with PBS <laughs> because they have these short films. And each week, the audience chooses one and maybe one of yours would be filmed. So Elizabeth, what would you, you're a producer. Um, yeah, well, we're, we're really excited to be at this festival. I think like any film festival, one of the most exciting parts is to meet the other filmmakers. Um, and so that I'm really looking forward to 
meeting more of the other filmmakers and, you know, creating a network from this awesome film festival and also just watching everyone else's work and, and being blown away. So that's what I'm really excited for with Socially Relevant. And in terms of the future for Gets Good Light, um, we are nominated for an NAACP Image Award, ah. um, which is so such an honor um, and so exciting. And Tell uh, us what that means. So the NAACP Image Awards are um, a, a huge award show that celebrate um, black creators and creators uh, focusing on social justice work in filmmaking. Um, and so we're super honored to be recognized um, by the NAACP. And um, we will be put into their virtual theater next week, March 22nd to 27th. And then they're doing a virtual award show this year. So um, we will have our award presented on um, March 23rd. And then there's um, other awards that are gonna be presented live. And I, I think it'll be available on BET and CBS uh, on the 27th. Um, so there's a lot to watch and a lot to be a part of, and we're just super excited to be nominated. Bravo, bravo. This How is cool. fabulous. This is wonderful. Please send me that information because we are already, we, I've already been doing that, but each time a film comes to the festival and then goes further to do other stuff, we like to highlight those uh, things. Yeah, absolutely. We've had a lot of films that have gone into distribution. They have gone, uh, actually, one is touring the schools right now, thanks to our friend, our mutual friend, actually Linda's friend, Barbara Nemko, who is on our jury, and so on and so forth. And these successes, not that we want to say, oh, there are feathers in our cap, not at all, but we want to be happy and applaud the filmmakers uh, and, um, you know, see that their efforts did not go unrecognized. Mm -hmm. and, and applause is important because we don't get many places to do it anymore right now, yeah. right? Arnold, what about your film? And your um, wife's, what's your wife's name? Yeah, her, her name's Andrea. Okay, yep. Andrea and Arnold. Yep, yep. So, um, for our, our film, I mean, we, I'm the same way. I just came here to network. I, you know, it's great meeting you guys. And, and that's kind of why I'd, I'd go to any film festivals to just network with filmmakers, get to know everyone. Um, I feel like I'm making short films all the time. They're the most feasible. So, of course, they're what I'm making. And I'm always reaching out to my, like, small network of, you know, 20 friends that I know here in L.A. to uh, to make them. And um, at the moment, we don't have any huge plans yet for the turn. We... Uh, we finished it a year ago and we've been going the whole festival route but at the same time you know of course i'm always looking to do bigger more budgeted work and um and we've mostly been using the film as like a pitching tool to uh to, to branch out to our next project um and and nothing has really you know come to fruition yet but you know hopefully it will at some point but uh yeah that that's all that's our plan with the film Excellent. Well, and, let and me I, say something oh. in that regard that uh, I'm, not, I'm sure you are aware, maybe you've already signed up for it. We have a workshop. We have a series of workshops and panels we're also presenting with the festival. And one of them uh, was yesterday. It was the SAG after a low budget film production. And they now have a mini <laughs> micro budget, which is under $25,000 with which you can make a feature film if there is such a possibility. Um, mm. uh, you know, so it's a, all very important information that we feel important that we should put it in front of our filmmakers. And on uh, Wednesday, that's tomorrow, we have a very important uh, panel, um, important people from who are in the media, PR, marketing uh, field will come and talk about how you use the PR machinery and the publicist and so on to secure a successful uh, marketing and uh, distribution plan for your film because it's very important. The buzz you create around it is what makes the film. In fact, the workshop is titled The Buzz That Made the Movie, That Made the Movie. You know? yeah. and on, that's great. 
Yeah. yeah. And then on Friday, we have a group of uh, industry professionals, three distributors, two of them digital, one of them uh, traditional and digital, uh, Cinema Libre Studio, Indie Pix, and Flixa wow. TV. All three of them are partners of the film festival, and Flixa TV specializes in women directed films. It's like a Netflix uh, platform, but only for women film directors. And then uh, Indie Picks, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, actually it's Aspect Ratio. Uh, Jordan was uh, initially with Indie Picks. Now he has his own company, uh, Aspect Ratio, and he's presenting Aspect Ratio in this uh, chat, which is a platform uh, for uh, digital distribution, as well as Cinema Libre Studio. Beth Portello will be talking. And right after that, Jordan is taking one-on-one -on -one con uh, consultations with filmmakers to advise wow. them on their particular films uh, and how to package, how to present, how to get it to the distribution level. And uh, whoever has signed up, uh, he already has been in touch, and uh, I get, I, I'm sure he has scheduled talks. So please, um, all the filmmakers, take advantage of these uh, workshops that we have uh, put together for you. Yes, definitely. And Jenna, have you um, explored where you're going next with this film? Yeah, I am. I mean, just doing the festival circuit, this is now our third film festival. We have another one next week, the Garden State Film Festival. And we just- Is that out on Long Island? No, that's in Asbury Park. In oh, Indy New festival. Jersey. Indie Festival, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and they're actually doing something in person with masks, masks, of course, but um, I don't really know what, what's happening here, but I mean, that's that'll be different. Um, and it'll be nice to see the film on a, on a larger screen. And um, and then we got into the Arab Women Film Festival, which is in Denmark. So that's our first international. Um, now, will you go to Denmark? I wish. I don't think I'm allowed to go to Denmark. No, I don't think so. In my mind, I'll be in Denmark. <laughs> but you yeah, also, I'm, you know, just doing festivals to meet fellow filmmakers, like Elizabeth and Arnold said, and, um, you know, just continuing to, uh, I would love to, you know, get represented as a writer at some point. So these are things I'm working towards. Um, but I love doing these festivals just for inspiration to see everyone's films and to meet fellow filmmakers. So, yeah. Now, do you have a new project you're, you're contemplating? Yes, I have um, two TV pilots that I've written that... Oh um that i'm i'm in the tv land right now in turn i am working on a feature but it's still in the it's still in the first draft stage so um not really not really focused on that at the moment but yes those are like my projects right now and could you in a short version for people to know what do you mean by a first draft as a film Ooh, if you could uh, <laughs> It's very long. Um, still trying to figure out really what the story is and getting the story as tight. I think story is so important. And as writers, you really have to know what your story is. There can't be a lot of kindas and sortas. You got to know what your character's going for and you got to make it as clear as possible. And you, so there's a lot of like trimming, trimming the fat in the, in the first kind of first pass of things when you're and when you do this do you envision it in terms of filmmaking or is it just storytelling i'm definitely very visual with my storytelling so um i always i always think as like a director and a filmmaker because also even tv is much more cinematic nowadays with streamers and everything and, and it also just excites me like you know thinking of images to Put it, putting that into into the work. So so I would say both. Excellent. And you, Arnold? You're you're muted. Sorry, I totally forgot. Um, I have a, a feature that I've been working on again with ah. my wife for for literally years now. We we started this, you know, back when we were kids. I feel like, but um, 
Now it's, tell uh, me, what are your responsibilities and what are hers? So we kind of co-produce everything. You know, we get the people together, we co-fund it, you know, we we manage the producing side. I am generally a director and she's always the actress. Um, ah. <laughs> and and you know, of course, like we we bring in other roles here and there depending on now, who's know, the writer. Uh, we kind of co-write it. Um, we sometimes bring on a writer, depending on the project. Um, for the feature that we've been writing for for literally years now, we have other writers involved. Um, we're not that's not our our number one forte. So we definitely you know outsource it to other people as well. Um, but we we've been writing this for years, and of course, like could you give us a little a hint about what the theme is? Well, the theme is something that we keep changing. Um, just like you, Jenna, I feel like the film keeps like adapting um, and, and I, I feel like we need to adapt it again, but it's essentially a murder mystery, um, ah. thriller, um, psychological film. It's, it's a bunch of different things um, packaged into, you know, a genre that kind of like died off in the 90s. Um, so it's kind of like, I don't know, a little bit of a comeback for that. Um, but but on top of all that, you know, we keep updating and changing it. So what I'm saying today might be totally different tomorrow. Um, uh -huh. but yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Nora, do you want to uh, take over? Or do you want me to ask more questions? Well, let me see how we're doing time wise. We still have a few more minutes, but let me take this opportunity to uh, to inform people about the festival again, because, uh, you know, we're in the middle of it. So people need to know how they can access and see your films. And uh, and then I'm going to come back to you and ask you some more questions, maybe a little about what you're planning next. They told us. Yeah, I know. I heard. But <laughs> how can we help? <laughs> oh, OK. That's that's what I mean. Um, so uh, the Socially Relevant Film Festival is in its full week of swing and is swinging with films, 63 from 33 countries on a myriad of topics, which range from a climate change and sustainability, disability seen in a, a positive light. Um, we have empowering women and girls, forms of uh, um, protest, not violence, forms of protest, um, immigration, migration, indigenous populations. We had earlier today genocide and survival. Then we have home. This is the, pro uh, the one we are in right now, home and belonging. Human trafficking is coming up next tomorrow and the days after. And we also have um, race, prejudice, discrimination. That's tomorrow afternoon and so on. We also have LGBTQ, of course, rights and youth and children, which you can catch on our YouTube channel. The festival's YouTube channel is called SR Socially Relevant Film Festival, obviously, and our, it will be simulcast on our uh, Facebook page. These are all free of charge. So are the uh, industry workshops we were talking about just now, and they can be accessed through the festival website from the link that is links that are in the uh, schedule. Uh, as far as the tickets and the streaming are concerned, they take place from uh, the festival streaming site, which is Spark Fest Live. Uh, you can access that also from the festival website. Here it is. I'll Scroll it, uh, scroll it so you can see. There is the red button and that will take you to the streaming site. Please come and join us. We have also a lot of networking opportunities. Just now, the filmmakers were talking about the fact that they are in the festival to network with each other. Every morning during this festival week from 10 to 11, I grab my coffee mug and sit there and filmmakers have been coming together and discussing, passing each other information, important networking and uh, resources and stuff like that. In fact, in today's coffee, um, we call it Cine Cafe, like cinema and cafe. In today's Cine Cafe, one of the filmmakers suggested that we should do this on a regular basis. Of course, 
monthly is going to be the one we choose because weekly is a little too much. People have too many commitments, too many obligations everywhere. So it's going to be difficult to uh, keep up with that. But once a month, we all get together, especially if you've been a filmmaker that already has been at the Socially Relevant Film Festival. You can come, share your ideas and network. But also we want to help filmmakers produce their films. That's what I want to come to by putting you not only in touch with distributors, but also producers. Uh, we had a script reading a series yesterday and um, uh, a selection of finalist scripts had 10 minutes each read from the scripts. We're also thinking of developing that further so that it becomes a regular occurrence um, and so on and so forth. So the festival is growing and it's, it will become what you make of it. And after this talk, after I, we take a half hour break, we're going to have the happy hour from 6 to 7, uh, from 6.30 to 7.30, actually. And then that's another opportunity to network because we're not in a situation where, uh, in in-person situation, where you can catch your fellow filmmaker in the cinema lobby and exchange two words or talk to a, about a project. This is the only thing we have right now. So can I make a suggestion, Nora? Please do, yes. You know, one of the things we used to do is we used to get their cards. Maybe, yes. maybe we could have a site in which we could have a film, the name of the film, the filmmaker or the producer, um, and then their email. So people can get to um, get in touch with yeah. them. Well, we have uh, everybody's emails, of course, and now uh, that's what happens. Usually at the beginning, I communicate with the filmmakers on a BCC basis. But once everybody has been announced that they are in the selection, I start putting everyone in the same email so that they can already start communicating with each uh, other great. and networking with each other. So all the filmmakers of this selection already have each other's emails. Oh, good. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So let me see. We have two more minutes. If you want to go around and say one final wrap-up word, so uh, I leave you uh, to do that, let you do, it, do that. Elizabeth. Um, yeah, I guess to wrap up, I, I just want to thank you both again, Linda and Nora, for having us and for hosting this festival. I, I'm really excited for the rest of the week. And Jenna and Arnold, it was so nice to meet both of you and I can't wait to watch your films. And uh, thank you. And Jenna? Yep, uh, I would say the same. I would say thank you for organizing such a holy, you know, so many events this week. Um, I look forward to catching you all in the cinema Cafe Happy Hour soon. Uh, I saw both of your films. I loved them. Thank you. Thank you um, to all the filmmakers as well. Um, keep at it, I would say. Yeah. And see you one day in person, hopefully. <laughs> Arnold. I think we um, get encouraged and empowered or invigorated by communicating with each other because what COVID has done is that it has isolated us each into our little corners. And uh, by coming together like this and talking about the projects and uh, appreciating each other's work, we really feel like, okay, wait a minute, there's still some value in this. I personally have a film in this festival. I keep forgetting about that, <laughs> which was supposed to be a play, a real play on a stage with actors. And then when COVID hit, I realized that it lent itself very easily to being uh, put on, on Zoom because it's monologues of immigrant women uh, in a play. And uh, I directed it at that. We filmed it, uh, of course, from the Zoom. And I felt, wait a minute, this really has the feel of a documentary film when all these women are sitting talking about themselves. So I put it together, re-edited, uh, cleaned it up a bit, made a bit of back and forth cuts. So instead of one speaks and then the other speaks, which was the case in the, the play, 
in this in the film case it's a little bit more cut into and then it's playing it's called i migrant woman so if you guys want to catch a chance it's 35 minutes it's one of the shorts so it's six o'clock now so i want to thank you so much every one of you for being there deciding to tell socially relevant stories human interest stories and really continuing in that uh, journey and linda thank you very much for uh, you know moderating in such a fantastic way asking all the inc incredible important questions and getting all our filmmakers um, engaged uh, in the chat if my you're pleasure <laughs> thank you so this is going to as, as soon as we finish it it's going to go uh, on our youtube channel and um, you know you're more than welcome to share it and uh, enjoy it again later all right thank you all thank you all for being here yeah thank you bye, -bye. <laughs> thank you bye, -bye. Thank you. bye, -bye.